что вошло в добрую традицию в рамках международного юридического форума обсуждать всерьез вопросы антимонопольного регулирования, причем не только на национальном уровне, а на уровне взаимодействия разных экономик, межгосударственном взаимодействии. И в связи с этим я хотел бы обозначить значит, цель нашей, нашего сегодняшнего углового стола. Наш круглый стол называется «Развитие конкурентной политики в рамках интеграционного образования». В рамках круглого стола мы обсудим вопросы, которые связаны с антимонопольным регулированием на уровне различных государств. У нас спикеры представляют государства с разными экономическими условиями и с разными different countries and different levels of interstate interaction. Based on the results of our discussion, we are expected to give an answer to the question and what ways of uh, legal regulation could be regarded as optimal under contemporary conditions and how should antitrust policy fit within this uh, whole system, whether antitrust uh, legislation should impact the economic activities of uh, entities and building on the exchange of experiences between different states we are expected to uh, probably uh, design some model role models I'd like to introduce our esteemed speakers uh, the key speaker, the anchor speaking, will be the head of the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service of the Russian Federation, Igor Artemyev. He has headed uh, this Federal Anti-Monopoly Service fast for more than 10 years, and he does have a lot to share, uh, especially in the uh, area of uh, international antitrust legislation. The next speaker will be Douglas Ginsburg, Chief Judge, uh, who of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia and uh, it is not his first time in Russia and each time his presentation uh, where he shares uh, his experience as a judge uh, is are always interesting. The next speaker will be uh, Mr. Oraz Galim Orazbakov who is chairman of the Agency for Competition Protection in the Republic of Kazakhstan. Uh, his uh, presentation is going to be extremely interesting, especially within the context uh, of our interaction uh, within the Eurasian economic space. And another speaker is Artak Shaboyan, uh, who is who are chairman of the State Commission for the Protection of Economic Competition in the Republic of Armenia. The Republic of Armenia also actively cooperates with the Russian Federation in a variety of areas, and uh, Artak Shaboyan's presentation is going to be interesting in the, within the context of our session. I would also like to introduce our esteemed Oliver Jazzy. Oliver Jazzy is Deputy Commissioner of the Competition Commission from South Africa, and naturally uh, this uh, is going to be of enormous interest for us, because he represents a different continent, but uh, a uh, rapidly developing economy from that continent of Africa. And uh, he uh, will share a lot of interesting issues. And with great pleasure, I'm introducing uh, Yanis Leanis, who is director of USL Center for Law, Economics, and Society uh, from London. And finally, Alexei Ivanov. Alexei Ivanov is director of the Department for the uh, Legal Policy of Skolkova. Uh, foundation. He is also head of the laboratory of law at the uh, Harris School of Economics in Skolkova. But before giving the floor to our first and anchor speaker, 
I would like to um, introduce my co-moderators, Anna Alberta Manuberova. She is chairperson of the uh, General Assembly on the uh, Committee for the uh, Promotion of Competition. So probably this is the leading forum uh, where the uh, leading lawyers discuss very serious issues uh, of antitrust regulation and legislation. So now I'd like to give the floor over to Igor Artemyev, and uh, he will uh, tell us about the development of the competition protection policy. And, uh, uh, good morning, dear friends. I would like to thank all our guests again for making it to this uh, uh, forum um, and uh, for visiting St. Petersburg, my native town. Hopefully the days spent here uh, will be remembered for a long time because this is the period of white nights, new meetings, new exciting conversations and, and uh, 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 I think that what is going to be said at this session will be the beginning of uh, an intensive interaction and sharing of ideas, and then it leads to some specific practical steps in legislation and other areas. So people assembled here, not numerous, but influential, because they do influence the decisions made in our countries in the area of antitrust uh, legislation. Now I'd like to ask you to show to project the second slide and uh, please um, uh, listen to uh, what I think about this area so first of all from our point of view our integration processes look as follows fast of Russia is responsible for antitrust uh, legislation enforcement in Russia then we have Eurasian uh, economic space where, together with Kazakhstan Belarus Armenia in the nearest pro future Kyrgyzstan is also uh, planning to join so we have uh, uh, commonly shared legislation here. Bring back my slide, please. And we have this commonly shared legislation and even uh, the uh, uh, superstructure that uh, the agency that uh, will con consider some antitrust related cases in trans border uh, transactions. Then we have CIS formation, so we do have a special committee agency on this level. Then we have BRICS countries where. To, uh, the five uh, countries united in this association and we have the agency discussing antitrust issues regarding that and then we have global community with such agencies as UNCTAD, OECD and uh, other uh, other uh, organizations and we together discuss uh, law enforcement uh, legislation and best practices in this regard russia if we take the global community russia uh, used to be a listener rather than speaker but within last years we started actively putting forward our methodologies and our initiatives and uh, here i would like to uh, share some of my considerations about how it can be done to achieve quick practical results. <clears throat> so in CIS, for example, we uh, dealt with the market of uh, air uh, transportation, telecom, uh, industrial uh, production and so on, pharmaceuticals. Uh, so as for and so uh, antitrust uh, investigations Mm, in those industries enabled us to make a commonly shared decision with, for example, Kazakhstan. In telecom, we managed to uh, decrease uh, the prices uh, several times. So what we do, uh, uh, we also, also enables us to compare, draw comparisons between the prices on medical drugs, on oil products, electricity. And if we see any, or if we reveal disbalance between the prices, then we try to investigate into the matter and uh, find explanation for this kind of disbalance. So within the framework of uh, CIS and the Customs Union, we we are trying just to introduce this uh, aligned mode uh, when uh, uh, anything that can impact uh, industrial production or consumer market 
so we can uh, uh, quickly diagnose uh, the deviations to and then uh, pass the verdict whether they are fair or unfair. Actually, this uh, approach proved very successful for uh, the countries involved. So what we would like to see changed and why it is that international uh, cooperation can be very uh, effective. Our goal is not to punish the violators of uh, antitrust laws, even though, of course, we do that. Our main goal is to um, just uh, investigate the cases, to study the cases and come to conclusions together with our partners from the Customs Union or CIS uh, in order to improve the production relations. So the oil products market in Russia, taking into consideration stock market uh, trade and others, is uh, such that oil companies won't be able to increase their prices without very uh, sound and robust uh, kind of uh, grounds for that, because uh, this such attempts would immediately be obvious, and they haven't done it for a long time. The same can be said about other types of industrial markets. Certain regulatory documents have been adopted, and uh, now we are witnessing some serious changes in metal industry, aviation, uh, and so on and so forth. And all that is related with antitrust policy that is pursued in the Russian Federation currently. So we see two ways. One is uh, that we call the long way. It's just a changing of laws, then getting all the necessary approvals in the government, then implement implementing and enforcing the laws. This is the long one. Then there is a shorter one. And I'm going to uh, describe it in more detail a little later. So, uh, just to show it, I would like to uh, describe the case uh, related with uh, uh, automotive industry. It was a uh, project and, uh, just done together with uh, global producers, Nissan, Toyota, and other car producers. And they consider Russia as a big and highly profitable sales market. Besides, uh, the Russian Federation has a lot of uh, foreign productions, and uh, this industry is highly attractive for investments. And uh, then it's uh, characterized by different types of localization of production. In some places, the coal cars are produced in uh, uh, the territory of Russia. In other cases, it's only partial assembly. Uh, and we decided just to consider the practice uh, towards the dealers that is pursued by those uh, highly esteemed transnational corporation. Having analyzed the European or and U.S. practices uh, of uh, TNCs, and we realize that in Russia they use uh, discriminatory practices, Dis they discriminate dealers, that they use unfair practices uh, dealing with Russia. Some of them have operated in Russia for 20 years, but those producers display one type of highly fair behavior in Europe and America, but in Russia they uh, kind of use the practices that have been banned in the European Union for a long time. And uh, that uh, uh, serves highly to the detriment of the industry. Mm. And uh, actually, this is the problem that uh, had been dealt with in America and Europe long time ago. Then we decided to assemble all the dealers and uh, independent uh, service stations. Uh, uh, dear producers, we believe we highly respect you. We recognize your contribution into the Russian economy. We are grateful for your investment. But the practices exercised in Russia are uh, not permissible. We believe that your behavior, your conduct in the Russian Federation should be the same as you demonstrate in the US and EU. Uh, there, they have already introduced some antitrust uh, laws and they regulate your behavior. But uh, not in Russia, but why it is that you display totally different behavior in Russia compared to EU and US? That was three years ago. The colleagues just smiled 
and uh, we thought that it would lead to nothing. Then we uh, designed a special by the government and we again invited them and said, you know what, we can adopt uh, some rules uh, and ask the parliament to pass uh, appropriate laws to regulate your behavior. And then we have this uh, draft and we are ready to implement this new law. But we do not want it. Uh, our suggestion is different. Uh, uh, try to form uh, some union, association, not a cartel, of course, but then discuss uh, this uh, issue in your association. And let's uh, assume two uh, leading directives of the EU issued in 2010-2011 concerning uh, automotive producers and anti-monopoly uh, practices. And let us have you sign voluntary obligation to follow the uh, voluntarily you will follow the uh, practices that you use in Europe and US and we are not going to adopt any new uh, regulatory laws Mm, but so it will be on your voluntary basis. And uh, now, several years later, and I believe it has been a big success of ours and our colleagues from automotive industry, so all the world leading brands signed this uh, agreement. The result of it that we have now is as follows. Let us take some of the established practices which are either pro-competition uh, or pro-competitive or anti-competitive. For example, we had serious discrimination of dealers on the part of car producers. Uh, dealers uh, had no rights, usually uh, producers would sign contracts with them for one year. Uh, actually, they dictated their will and even stipulated the prices and even stipulated the territorial division of the sales market. They wouldn't, uh, so it's just very well known uh, anti competitive practices. After the signing of the uh, aforementioned agreement, such examples of discrimination are no longer existent. The next item is uh, repair uh, of the cars of uh, competing brands. If it is a shop of Mercedes, then this shop would repair only means Mercedes's. But that becomes more expensive for the dealers and it's not convenient for consumers. Now we have big pavilions and they just repair Toyotas, Nissans, Mercedes's. Uh, maybe there are partitions between the workshops and so on. So and thus we have uh, several service center under one ro roof that uh, indeed uh, just uh, supported the development of companies Petition, so we can have two big pluses here. Uh, then this combination of selling cars and uh, service. In Europe, there is no banning on that. Mm, it is allowed. Uh, you, uh, what can be banned in EU is uh, selling uh, simultaneously the car and saying no repair should go separately. So we managed to convince the car producers that this would be a better approach for Russia as well. The same is true about the supply of spare parts. And uh, Russian uh, repair shops uh, now uh, can really repair all those brand cars. Uh, you may ask, how can it be differently? Of course it is possible. And it's not uh, necessary to go to the brand center and just get the repair of your brand only there, which is uh, thrice more expensive. Now they can go to a Russian sh shop, a repair shop, and go. Of course, if it is still under warrant, you should go to the brand uh, repair service. But then, why doing that? Well, it was explained by a special kind of knowledge of culture codes and computer codes and all that, so producers, they wouldn't share those codes uh, with uh, other dealers and repair shops. Uh, in other words, this car, car maker's code and our policy resulted in Russia having thousands of repair shops uh, that repair all brand cars. Uh, well, the only, you know, the uh, security codes are not uh, shared because, of course, the brands, they protect their uh, security codes and we can't really ex expect them to. Uh, so, in uh, next slide, please. Yeah. 
in other words uh, instead of uh, taking a very hard line initially going through the thorny uh, pathway of uh, courtrooms uh, we uh, decided to opt for another solution Together with uh, other stakeholders, the current makers and the service providers, uh, we managed to come together over a code of conduct, conduct uh, with a provision that uh, we will be conferring uh, on every issue that um, may arise in the future. We will skip uh, slide number 10, slide number 11. Now here I'm, I'm coming to my uh, main idea. Take uh, the uh, BRICS countries. The BRICS countries are discussing uh, the creation of uh, a conglomerate of uh, national regulators. Now imagine uh, if we managed to establish a working group that would identify commonalities uh, on our markets, for example, in pharmaceutical industry, a very promising market uh, with a high uh, rate of growth, growing uh, transborder exchanges. We uh, can obviously see that the situation with the price setting with competition is very bad. Russia is the country with the highest uh, prices for pharmaceuticals in the context of um, very modest incomes of that population. So um, we thought why shouldn't uh, the five of us, 40% of population by the way, come together and identify bad practices in pharmaceuticals or in uh, car sales. Then we would try to match bad practices with good practices. We may even borrow some good practices from elsewhere, like uh, the United States. After having uh, done this uh, analytical work, uh, we would uh, proceed uh, to finding solutions. We could uh, bring together all uh, leaders of the pharmaceutical industry at a platform, at a forum or whatever, and uh, ask them to come together over these uh, bad practices request them to find solutions. Here we have a body of uh, good practices and uh, tested regulations in Europe. Please try to apply them in the context of the BRICS countries. You are very respected investors, uh, producers and service providers. We cannot do without your services. However, we appeal to you within a time frame of two years uh, to create a framework of good practices for yourselves. Here's the deadline, here's the body of good practices, here's the premises, sit down together, talk these things through and come out with a solution. Our countries, our populations need fair conditions on the market of pharmaceuticals. If we manage uh, to do that uh, simultaneously, we can uh, expect a very good outcome. We're not asking for anything uh, supernatural for anything outstanding. It's just an appeal uh, to do their business in a fair, civilized manner. We're giving, you, giving them the resources, uh, we're giving them support. We are displaying patience. Therefore, we can expect uh, some uh, outcome 
uh, from um, from this community. Again, I can quote uh, a huge number of um, good practices accumulated in the United States, uh, in Europe. So the bottom line is, we propose uh, at all different formats to um, start preparation through, during 1915 of a number of uh, regional workshops or conferences that would set the stage uh, for the creation of a common regulatory space. We are prepared to lead uh, this exercise in the CIS, for example, or in the Customs Union. Union. We will be, we, the uh, authorities will be very friendly to you. Once we do the job uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, we could move over to other industries, transplant uh, the outcomes uh, to car makers, uh, car sales, uh, whatever. What is more important, we'll create an environment of regulations that uh, would be respected by other transnational companies from outside our BRICS community. Therefore, we will save a huge amount of time. Instead of uh, 15 or 20 years going painstakingly, step by step, individually, we would uh, make a quantum leap in uh, Frame in a time frame of two or three years, all at the same time improving uh, competitiveness and fair practices. So uh, international integration can be a platform uh, of uh, making this uh, uh, warping space and time, figuratively speaking, and make a leap in uh, this respect. This is a matter, an existential matter for our uh, populations. Uh, we have to have fair practices in the pharmaceutical markets. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Igor Yurievich. This was a very passionate and uh, substantial uh, contribution. I would like to give you an opportunity for a couple of questions then we will move on to a, a new to our new speaker first as a moderator may i ask uh, you a question you are saying uh, that uh, codes of conduct and uh, promotion of good practices uh, is uh, the way uh, of the future is this uh, part of uh, public regulation or is it a purely internal um, decision of uh, a community concerned well it is a uh, type of behavior that is um, promoted or imposed uh, by the government this is a give and take we are pushing um, the con communities concerned uh, to behave well to self-organize to stop uh, the laissez-faire type of conduct in Russia, whereas at home uh, they are abiding and uh, by uh, all uh, regulatory norms and uh, requirements. And that would be a first step, followed uh, probably by others. Uh, but all other steps will be purely consensual this is a, what we are doing is not sanctioning them, uh, is not punishing them. We're simply softly pushing them to the proper type of behavior, which is a good thing in itself. Oh, thank God in the uh, service sector we are witnessing uh, a massive growth of self-regulatory environments like the one with the car makers and service providers. Very well. Questions? Anton Rogachevsky, Baltica. Igor Yurevich, I liked your slide with the uh, dolls, with the, with, the, with the Russian dolls. 
it is a, a good uh, illustration of um, mutual interaction. Is there an example or maybe uh, several examples of uh, positive regulation like the one you are promoting within um, the uh, customs union? Roughly 12 months ago, uh, we initiated, together with Kazakhstan and Belarus, uh, an analytical exercise. Now Kyrgyzstan is moving uh, into the fold. The purpose was to analyze the state of uh, socially sensitive markets, food, um, pharmaceuticals, uh, household goods, and so many others. Now uh, we are moving into the format of the Eurasian Commission, Antitrust Commission. It is uh, inheriting uh, the uh, analytical work of uh, the working group. Therefore, the work is on the way. The, uh, the Troika will be followed by the uh, Quartet, uh, plus Kyrgyzstan, and then uh, plus Armenia. We are gaining weight. Uh, we are um, becoming highlighted uh, or seen in the international uh, landscape. Our next uh, step would be to uh, show a bit of uh, teeth. Transnational corporations might know that the national regulations or regional regulations like BRICS is uh, something uh, to be reckoned with. They cannot be ignored or just uh, elbowed away. So initially we will um, accumulate knowledge and practices uh, in the customs union. Once we do that, we will uh, step forward with our proposals uh, within the BRICS. We will uh, come forward with uh, practical experience and practical solutions, uh, not just uh, proposal and uh, wishful, uh, wishful talk. We must be able uh, to uh, show our performance, to be heard and uh, to convince our listeners. More questions, please? Good morning. Tatiana Kaminska. I have a couple of comments and a question. First. Your suggestion, a model of uh, decision-making for business that is uh, comprehensible to the business community. This is a good idea when uh, businesses meet regulators and discuss their issues. Businesses will know where to come to with their troubles and concerns and uh, ask for solutions, ask for assistance. I would like to ask uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg, what is uh, your opinion over this idea? And the question is, um, any, are there other industries besides uh, pharmaceuticals where such type of uh, public business engagement uh, would bear fruit? Everything that has to do with uh, machine tool buildings, except probably um, military providers, military producers. Probably I would uh, exclude uh, producers of um, electronic equipment. As a rule of thumb, uh, we would uh, try to promote such conditions uh, where wherever there is a number of uh, foreign actors involved. 
since national producers and uh, international producers must uh, play by the same rules. Why pharmaceuticals was the first uh, industry to uh, to go through this procedure? Because 80% of our pharmaceuticals come uh, from uh, from abroad. Same goes uh, for certain types of high-tech equipment, uh, certain types of education, certain types of medical treatment. Initially, I would uh, limit myself to large major markets like automobile construction, uh, like uh, major machine tool producers, probably uh, grain producers, maybe aviation industry. Why not? Open skies is a matter for discussion. So there's so many different and uh, very much, pretty much individual situations. On the other hand, I don't want uh, to impose my opinion on anyone. So pharmaceuticals uh, will be our cornerstone. As far as uh, other markets are concerned, um, we should give it uh, a good uh, analytical treatment. I have another question, uh, if you, uh, if I may. Russian law enforcement practices is very extensive. It could be uh, taken as a basis for a regulatory effort uh, within uh, the customs union and the Eurasian space. That would be one way to go. Another way to go is simply to borrow European uh, good practices and try to implant them, uh, adopt them to uh, Russian climate. What, uh, what is uh, your opinion on these two possible pathways of development? My opinion is to draw upon um, West European and American standards, uh, since they're very mature, they're tested, uh, they're fine-tuned. If we opt uh, to uh, start uh, from all over again, we would lose um, 10 to 15 years. We cannot afford uh, to waste so much time. I want to make a breakthrough within two or three years. No time to waste. To uh, gain the speed, uh, to make a leap, uh, we have to come to terms. We have to uh, come to, to a consensus over a set of standards. But, so the best seeds uh, of uh, Mm, around uh, for a consensus is uh, something that is mature, which is uh, Western standards. What we insist on, that the rules uh, apply in the same way as they are applied in Western countries. Transnational companies, uh, international companies must behave in the way they behave at home. They never behave in Russia like they behave at home. We cannot tolerate the situation, and we must uh, move and intervene. We, Russia cannot be uh, a receiving end of uh, profit-making. Don't skimp on, on your Russian activities and your Russian customers. Thank you. Now we must move on. Now I uh, give the floor to Douglas Ginsburg, Justice uh, Ginsburg. He is uh, a judge in uh, the District of Columbia. Please. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to thank um, uh, Mr. Atemyev and um, the organizers for inviting me to participate in this uh, forum. This is, um, uh, I think, my third visit uh, to uh, Russia and to the um, Federal Anti-Monopoly Service, where I 
met with um, uh, Mr. Puyrzewski uh, 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 yesterday and some of the other members of the uh, senior staff. And I hope there'll be future opportunities for, uh, for exchange of uh, experiences, uh, particularly as the, uh, as the multinational framework for the Eurasian uh, economic zone um, takes shape and comes into force. Um, I'm going to uh, defer my, uh, my planned remarks for a couple of minutes to answer uh, the question from the floor and to address some of the things that um, uh, Mr. Artemyev uh, has already said. Um, and let me say first that the idea of not wasting time, of borrowing where you think there is a good fit between overseas practices and your own market situation um, is uh, eminently sensible. Um, and I remember making the same advice, giving the same advice um, to uh, the, the leadership in the Czech, uh, in Czechoslovakia 20 some years ago when they were uh, needed to pass all sorts of laws to create um, commercial uh, code and uh, uh, financial instruments and so on. And this could take years, and my advice was simply adopt perhaps the German civil code and then change it as you go if you need to change it, but get started right away. Because there will always be differences. Not, every, not something will not fit entirely into a new context, but if it fits 90%, that's a very good start and you can make adjustments uh, <clears throat> later on. Now that said, the approach of dealing with um, the major firms in a particular industry, automobiles, pharmaceuticals, or what have you, um, does raise uh, concerns uh, based on the experience that we've had in the US. And I will uh, begin by paraphrasing, because I didn't bring the text with me, paraphrasing something said by, written by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, uh, 1776 publication, in which he said basically, um, men of the same trade rarely come together before, uh, without soon uh, the talk turning to um, uh, ways in which to um, exploit the public and defeat the public interest. And so um, we have taken a, uh, in the US, a um, skeptical attitude toward um, cooperative efforts, cooperative efforts and trade association activities um, which is not to say that they are prohibited and sometimes they are even encouraged, but we are very concerned about competitors coming together to undertake a useful publicly approved task and their being together somehow becoming an opportunity to do things that are anti-competitive. So we have in the U.S. experience with what we call self-regulatory organizations. And these are ongoing uh, entities. They don't just come together and agree on a code of practices. They, they uh, continue to uh, exist to alter their rules as, based on experience and even to adjudicate disputes. A prime example would be the um, regulation of the securities industry. There's a government agency, the Securities and Exchange uh, Commission, but it has delegated um, the uh, a substantial role to, um, the, to the self-regulatory organizations encompassing the different um, exchanges, uh, stock exchanges, um, and authorizing them, for instance, to discipline um, individuals who breach the code of ethics, uh, to uh, erect a, a quasi-judicial procedure, really, with a hearing and so on, subject to review by the government agency. Um, they also promulgate uh, rules for their members, again, subject to approval um, by the uh, government agency. 
And that scheme has uh, yielded a number of important instances in which we found that the, um, that the authorized self-regulatory organizations have exceeded um, their, uh, their assigned task um, in, or have adopted practices that sound good but which have had um, an anti-competitive effect. Perhaps they had an anti-competitive purpose. We don't know, but they certainly had an anti-competitive effect. <clears throat> Pardon me. A leading example that went to the U.S. Supreme Court involved the National Society of Professional Engineers. And they, are, they had a code of ethics that prohibited engineers, civil engineers, from, uh, from, from, am I together still? Yes. From submitting uh, competitive bids um, when, uh, when a project was put up for bid. And the, uh, this was deemed an unethical practice on the theory that it would lead engineers to cut corners, to economize in ways that would um, compromise the quality of their engineering and perhaps the safety of, their, uh, of the buildings. Um, this was uh, treated by the Supreme Court, uh, I think correctly, as um, something which, which would uh, necessarily have the effect of raising prices, being anti-competitive, harmful to consumers who in this case were actually um, companies that put out, uh, that, uh, that re requested um, uh, uh, bids for particular engineering jobs. And um, experience has shown that abolishing that prohibition on competitive bidding has not in fact created problems with buildings falling down. Uh, or other uh, uh, things that the, uh, that the uh, professional society had claimed. Um, and this is a common practice, uh, or I should say common um, dilemma that arises in the EU as well, where uh, lawyers, for instance, um, have uh, regulatory, self-regulatory practices. There's a case in the European uh, Court of Justice, uh, which actually involves a, a, a association rule coming from the Netherlands that said uh, non-lawyers, I think accountants in that case, could not be partners in a law firm. And um, the court said, well, look, this is really a national question. Uh, we're going to le leave it alone. Um, but it's the kind of thing that uh, the professions typically are allowed to, to do for themselves. Now, when it comes to automobiles and pharmaceuticals and heavy industry and so on, we don't have um, experience with that, with self-regulation. On the other hand, we don't have, we didn't have the benefit that you are pointing to of existing codes from other places. Um, so I think your, uh, your effort to um, leapfrog uh, the process uh, is, uh, is, is wise, but requires caution as well um, to scrutinize all of the practices that are um, uh, proposed to make sure that they are uh, not themselves anti-competitive. Now, um, another situation that arises that's of a similar nature are uh, standard setting organizations. Um, and these are typically um, um, associations of companies that uh, deal in the same uh, product space. A, a prominent example is uh, the uh, association in dealing with uh, standards in electrical engineering. And their function is to um, adopt standards that all manufacturers will observe so that all of their products are interoperable. I didn't make it makes uh, a great deal of sense to have a single standardized USB plug and a USB port uh, so that different manufacturers can compete against each other by meeting the standard. But that too, we have found, has given rise to some anti-competitive problems. For instance, in one prominent case that came to my court, um, several companies were saying, pr pr proposing that their standard be adopted. 
Now the premise is that if, if your standard is adopted, you agree, the association agrees to adopt it, and you agree to license all comers to use that standard under fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. So in one instance, a company persuades the, uh, the uh, association to adopt a particular standard uh, without revealing uh, that it has a patent uh, on the standard. It had not entered into a licensing uh, uh, agreement because it hadn't revealed that it had a standard. And so it then tried to uh, uh, charge royalties for use of, the use of its uh, copy of its patented standard. Now, it turned out that for reasons that are not relevant here, the company was, was not liable because it couldn't show injury, but um, it's an example of how that process, which was created specifically for a good public purpose, to create and promote interoperability by allowing companies to coordinate, could be perverted by one company or another uh, to, uh, to its own advantage. Now, that said, um, I turn to the topic of um, the problems that can arise when you have a, um, a multi-state or a multinational um, association of countries or states that deal with competition issues. Uh, now, to give you two or uh, three uh, d types of examples, the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, does not create a competition agency. In fact, it doesn't contain competition norms. So the three member countries, Canada, the United States, and Mexico, each keep their national competition authorities and operate as they would um, even if there were no, uh, no NAFTA. However, because the three economies are so tightly integrated, the three agencies find it uh, really essential to cooperate with each other on a, on a constant basis. To just take Canada and the US, Canada's population and its gross product, gross domestic product, is approximately 10% of that of the US. U Canada is the US's largest trading partner, and vice versa. So there's a tremendous quantity of cross-border activity. And any significant merger is going to have, of two companies is going to have an effect, um, or may have an effect, in both Canada and the US. There's almost as many would also affect Mexico, but Canada and the US is the, the cleanest example. And so the, the two agencies end up, the uh, Competition uh, Commissioner of Canada and one of the two U.S. agencies, either the Federal Trade Commission or the Department of Justice Antitrust Division, uh, end up um, with pre-notification review of substantial mergers above a certain level of turnover. And um, they need to coordinate their activities very closely to make to compare their under their analysis, to um, if they think there are problems, to try to agree on what would be an appropriate remedy, so that they're not imposing conflicting uh, or uh, well conflicting remedies or, or conditions on the consummation of the merger, um, and this works really quite well. Now. In other contexts, there have been instances where the coordination has failed. One example, prime example, uh, was between the EU and the US, which are not part of any common association, but which still have many transactions, again, particularly mergers, that have to be reviewed in both, um, in both jurisdictions. And, um, we had a, uh, a, a substantial uh, disagreement and surprise, I guess I'd say, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago actually, when the United States had already approved the merger of two US companies, General Electric acquiring Honeywell, and the European Commission disapproved the merger. 
And this came uh, as quite a surprise. I think the U.S. agencies thought the EU's reasoning was not very persuasive. Had, this has not happened again in 12 years, and it's quite clear that it's because the agencies are in constant communication. So that if one has a problem, the other one knows about it before it announces a final decision. An example was a, uh, um, I think it was Oracle's acquisition of SAP, a German company, and um, there was a trial. The United States uh, Antitrust Division opposed the merger. It, it went to trial in San Francisco, and the United States lost. The merger was approved by the uh, Court of First Instance, and the government said it would not appeal that decision. And just very shortly thereafter, the European Commission said we approve the transaction as well. So I interpret that as meaning that the European Commission was waiting to see what happened in the trial. Why should they say we approve the transaction if it's, a, if, if it's not going to go through in the U.S. courts? So when you enter into a multinational arrange, uh, confederation, um, the coordination is going to have to be extremely close, even closer than the two examples I gave where there is no common uh, law or common uh, agency. Now, I, th I think it's, if I understand correctly, um, uh, Sergei, it's not yet determined whether there will be, or maybe it is, a, uh, for the Eurasian economic community, a competition agency that is in addition to the three national agencies. Is that still an open question? Yeah, okay. Um, when that happens, if it is created, then it follows more the European community uh, model. And um, in a way, the United States is also a federation of 50 jurisdictions, each of which, each of our states has its own competition law. Now, some of them, indeed most of them, look very much like the uh, the federal law, the Sherman Act. But some are different. Some of the state's courts have said whether our statute is exactly the same or a little different, we treat the federal interpretations by the courts of the federal law as being binding on our interpretation of the state law. Other states do not. Other states say uh, we treat that only as persuasive but we will not necessarily follow the interpretation that the federal courts give the federal law, even if our laws look exactly alike. So to give you two uh, very prominent, important examples, um, in the 19, I think late 1960s, the U.S. Supreme Court decided that um, a, in a private action for damages under the Sherman Act, um, where the plaintiff is entitled to uh, treble, that's three times its actual uh, damages. Um, the defendant um, could not raise a, a defense, there was not, would not be a defense to say, well, you shouldn't be suing me, I shouldn't have to pay this, I passed the increase on from my cartel onto the next level of, uh, in the supply chain. And correspondingly, the Supreme Court said in a related case, well, plaintiffs, consumers, purchasers should not be able to sue if they are the indirect purchaser. They should only, only the first uh, purchaser again, from the cartel should have a right to recover, even though, even though the overcharge is passed on down the line. They said it would be too complicated, it would risk um, uh, duplicative recovery, and so uh, we don't uh, allow, we read the statute as authorizing only the direct purchaser to recover damages. Well, 38 states disagree. In 38 states, the indirect purchasers can also sue. So sometimes this was done by the state legislature passing a law amending their statute. Other times it was done by their courts saying, we interpret our statute, even though it looks the same, as di differently than the feds and the federal government interprets its statute or federal courts, are in our state indirect purchasers that can recover. Now this does create 
some awkwardness for companies, uh, particularly uh, well, companies, particularly companies that are small and don't or medium and don't have uh, good advice. It really creates a great demand for legal advice to know what goes on in each state in which a company might operate. Uh, another example is that in 2010, our Supreme Court decided that um, for a manufacturer to fix a minimum resale price, saying, saying that the, the, the product cannot be sold for less than X to the ultimate consumer, uh, which had been condemned as per se unlawful for 90 some years, would no longer be treated as per se unlawful. It would be subject to the rule of reason. So in other words, it would require an investigation or a court inquiry in each case whether the pro-competitive consequences of setting a minimum resale price were, were uh, significant and outweighed any anti-competitive uh, consequences. Now you might say, well, how could there be pro-competitive consequences from setting a resale minimum price? But the Supreme Court said, in the last 25 or 30 years, there's developed an economic literature that shows that in some circumstances, consumers are better off with a resale minimum price. They actually buy more of the goods, not less. Um, and in other instances, uh, that's not true. They just end up paying more for the same thing. So instead of saying it's always unlawful, we'll say it's only unlawful where the bad effects outweigh the good effects. Well, what does that mean in state law? Three big states, New York, Illinois, and California, have all said this does not apply in our states. We still treat minimum resale prices as per se unlawful. So a manufacturer has to be quite discriminating in saying which state, in which states, if it wants to fix minimum resale prices, in which states that will uh, do so and in which it will not. And that can happen is whenever there are two or more jurisdictions that have a common framework law, but are also authorized to have supplemental laws that go further, that condemn more uh, than the, than the uh, uh, than the overarching law uh, condemns. Um, this also creates issue whenever there's a multi-jurisdictional arrangement. It also creates questions as to whose law, which state's law applies in a particular lawsuit. Okay, so if uh, if someone buys their goods in Belarus and they uh, the manufacturer is in Russia and they sue the manufacturer, the Russian company, in the courts of Belarus. the question arises, should the courts entertain that case? Did the company really subject itself to the jurisdiction of that, uh, of Belarus? Well, we've had many cases uh, raising this question with all sorts of variations. The Supreme Court has said, at the very least, the company must have some contact with that state if it's going to be sued there. Just advertising or responding to an order, uh, purchase order, or receiving an order over the internet does not mean it went into that country or that state and subjected itself to their laws. On the other hand, if it has a presence there, if it has an office or a dealer, or it sh regularly ships goods there, you would expect, it would be certainly, uh, it, would, it would claim that it could go into Belarus's courts and sue someone who didn't pay their bill, and likewise they should be able to be a defendant. A plaintiff who has a problem with the, uh, a competition grievance should be able to uh, sue the manufacturer in the, in the consumer's own state. Um, again, each of our states has a, its own statute saying how far its jurisdiction reaches. The Supreme Court has said absolute minimum, there must be certain degree of contact. But some states have what are called long-arm statutes. The long arm of the law will reach out 
and bring that defendant into the court. And they define what, uh, the standard uh, in a variety of different ways. So if you're in a multinational situation, with or without a supranational law, these problems can be anticipated. They should be anticipated. And indeed, if you look at the experience uh, in, the, in the US, you'll be able to anticipate them just as you are borrowing from uh, codes of good practice abroad, you might be able to avoid problems that have arisen elsewhere um, and try to uh, provide simple objective rules in advance so that does not everything has to go through the courts to be decided on these jurisdictional um, questions. Um, I think I should probably uh, stop at this point, uh, if, if you think so, Sergey, and, and I can take questions or come back uh, with more later on. Thank you very much, Mr. Ginsburg. And uh, I will uh, allow two or three questions from the audience now, and then we'll have a discussion in the end. Are there any questions to Judge Ginsburg? Mr. Atermia. Uh Mr. Ginsburg, my question is as follows. Very often in the contract signed between the companies, Mm, we see the following, that when uh, they uh, say that all the disputes will be uh, considered abroad in some international arbitrage courts in London or elsewhere, and so companies, they include this uh, clause into their contracts. In other cases, uh, it's probably not written, but uh, one of the parties uh, just uh, applies to foreign court. Uh, in your U.S. practice, um, are any antitrust disputes uh, considered by uh, foreign courts in Europe or maybe in some other kind of tribunal? Uh, are such cases known? I'm just wondering if this experience uh, is familiar to you, because for us it's a serious challenge. Well, in general, our approach is to say that if the parties agree to arbitration, anywhere, if they agree to which law should be applied, any law, our courts will not upset that decision. The, uh, and so uh, many form contracts require arbitration, uh, the purchase of an automobile, purchase of shares on an exchange, um, ordering a, uh, uh, a computer over the internet. Um, making a, um, uh, using a credit card, all of the agreements between the consumer and the uh, company have arbitration clauses in them. And our courts have been very consistent in saying, if you agreed to arbitration, you have to go to arbitra private arbitration before you can come into court. And if you come into court, we will not upset the result unless there was fraud, unless the, the procedure was basically a sham. Now. I can give you an example where it was. It wasn't a competition case, but it, it gives you an idea. And I had this case. An employee of a California company was working in Manila, Philippines. He was being transferred to Jakarta, Indonesia. And so at the company's expense, he went to Jakarta to, buy, to uh, look for housing for his family. And he was being shown around by a real estate agent when he was kidnapped. And the kidnappers in uh, Indonesia uh, told his employer that uh, they demanded 50,000 US dollars for releasing him. The employer refused to pay. And the next communication they got was, or the next envelope they got, contained an ear cut off from the employee. At that point, they paid the money. The employee returned to California, uh, to the District of Columbia, pardon me, um, Washington and sued the California company. And the California company said, we have an employment contract with you. It says arbitration in Paris. And you must post a bond under the rules of the Paris arbitration uh, chamber. You must post a bond of $175,000.
before you can bring your case. Now, the, law, the, the, all, the contract also said the law of California applies. So my court looked at the law of California and said there's a consumer protection provision in the law of California that says an unconscionable contract cannot be enforced. And we, and we said we are confident that a California court would say this was an unconscionable contract. So with all the respect we have for arbitration clauses, somebody figured out a way to abuse that, uh, that privilege. And it could happen easily in a competition uh, case. There's a, one, to be brief, there's a case in um, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in Chicago in which um, somebody ordered a computer from Gateway. Uh, the computer arrived. In the box, there's a piece of paper saying, by ordering this computer, you agreed to arbitration. If you don't want to agree, return the computer. And they kept the computer and then later had a dispute and the court said, keeping the computer was agreeing to arbitration. So. Uh, Antitrust agency initiated a change in our legislation, uh, reducing the number of cases, introducing the prevention institute. When uh, the minimum if the antitrust agency uh, sees any tokens of the violation of antitrust legislation before um, uh, uh, starting the case, they give a warning to the company. So what is your opinion about this? As far as I know, in the US, there is a so-called quick look approach. In what uh, situations, what cases, uh, do you uh, use this uh, or exercise this quick look approach? And uh, when uh, do you decide that a deeper investigation is necessary? Um, uh, let me to be let me clarify that there are two uh, stages at which this question can come up. The first part of your question about uh, warning the companies, um, and that would be something that the, um, that the enforcement agency uh, would do, uh, not, not a court. So the enforcement agency, um, if the enforcement agency approaches a company um, about a practice, a, a type of conduct, uh, I th something that might here be regarded as abusive dominant position or as violating consumer protection standards. Um, the, uh, the company, if the company stops the conduct, that is the end of the matter. Now there might be private parties who want to sue for damages, but the Federal Trade Commission can just, all it could do is get an order from a court to make them stop, so if they'll stop voluntarily, so much the better. Um, but if the case goes to court, then the, the quick look question arises. It's a way for a court to economize on, its, um, uh, on the analysis that's needed to, uh, to bring the case. And it has authorized, well, I shouldn't say that, the agencies have, have followed the court's practice. So the court has said, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> A rule of reason case, okay, if it's not per se unlawful, if this practice, if it requires a rule of reason analysis, this can be a very complicated, drawn out, long procedure of great cost to the parties, a lot of the court's time. If we can take a quick look and determine that there is uh, not a problem here, we should try to do that. Right? And just uh, um, terminate the case at an early stage. More re that started in, um, in the early 1980s in our Supreme Court. More recently, the Federal Trade Commission has said, with respect to some practices, we shouldn't have to do a complete definition of the market and uh, rule of reason analysis if the practice 
even though it's not per se unlawful, looks like a practice that is per se unlawful. And that came to my court, and I wrote this opinion, saying that if the, if the practice has what I called a family resemblance to something that is per se unlawful, then the agency can skip the market definition and go right to the practice. And the example, in, in the facts in that case, involved this famous um, recordings by the three tenors, Pavarotti and the, and the other two. And two different record companies uh, held licenses to the first and second uh, recordings in the series. And when the third recording was going to come out, they formed a joint venture to create the third recording. And they agreed that for the first six or nine months while they're promoting the new recording, neither of them would advertise or give discounts on the first two recordings. Now, this looks like market division, right? It looks like a per se unlawful violation. And they said, well, it's a joint venture. We're creating a new product. It's really incident to that. It shouldn't be considered uh, per se unlawful. The Federal Trade Commission said, to launch a new product, to have a joint venture, does not mean you have to stop competing on your other products. And we said, the court said, exactly right. This looks just like any plain old market division. Yes, there was a joint venture, but this was not an essential part of it. So the commission doesn't have to decide are records by three tenors the relevant market? Is it all opera records? Is it all sort of, uh, all classical music? Which, of course, the defendants were arguing. They said, oh, we're, there's no separate market for three tenors. It, we're just a tiny part of a much larger market, and this can't possibly have any bad effect. Um, but uh, we rejected that and said, it looks to us like a market division. Whatever the market might be, you're dividing it. Thank you very much. We must move ahead somehow. And uh, yes, uh, Igor Artemiev. Quick look. Например, в тех случаях, когда дело будет аналогичным уже вынесенным решением Верховного Суда России. То есть, если есть прецедент, и есть дело идентично. And there is a, the case is uh, analogous, similar, or the same, then probably quick look approach would be uh, possible uh, with reference uh, to previous practice. So this is a very interesting theme for us, and we should come back to that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Indeed, this is a very interesting uh, question. It is a matter of uh, saving time and energy, uh, which is always a good thing. Now, moving forward, uh, now I give the floor to the uh, National uh, Competition Protection Agency of Kazakhstan. Galim Urazbakov. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Moderator. I would like to use this opportunity to extend my gratitude to the organizers uh, who uh, invited me to take part in this discussion. Kazakhstan is a member of a um, whole set of integrational um, frameworks. The CIS, uh, the Customs Union and the uh, budding Eurasian uh, Union. I believe uh, those uh, three uh, integrational entities uh, are the framework for regulatory effort of uh, member nations. After the uh, signature of the Eurasian Treaty, we are moving basically and mostly to the platform of the Eurasian Union or building a uh, common uh, economic space, uh, common regulatory space. 
we are challenged uh, to create a unified set of rules regulating um, comp competition. We already have a model law on competition. Right now we are in the process of uh, implementing uh, this um, model law into our national laws. We believe uh, its provisions uh, will significantly improve the health of the, um, the competition. The model law is uh, based on uh, best international practices. It has direct action and is extraterritorial. It provides an opportunity for um, engagement of uh, the public authorities in business activities. As a model, uh, we are uh, often uh, using the experience of Singapore. At this point in time, we are working on the expansion of powers of the uh, national regulator. Experts and international practices uh, confirm uh, uh, the right choice that we have made. As of July, we are receiving a group of uh, experts from the OECD who will um, assess the state of our legislation against uh, international standards. The Treaty on the Eurasian Union contains a separate chapter on uh, cooperation in antitrust and competition protection including uh, articles that provide uh, for persecution beyond national borders. We also are building uh, frameworks uh, for joint efforts uh, on international markets, uh, for example, in roaming, uh, in uh, the exchanges of uh, food and food products, uh, aviation, and so many others. The new format of integration opens uh, opportunities for broader international uh, engagement of uh, Kazakhstan. Back in 1993, we realized that the benefit of international cooperation, we, together with our, together with our Russian colleagues, we established an international bilateral and uh, later trilateral um, antitrust and competition protection committee, later joined in by Kyrgyzstan, Azerbaijan. Probably this was a bit premature back then. However, we had this insight, intuition, that we will eventually have to do this job. The uh, realization uh, of uh, the way forward was there. We have to come together and uh, build uh, new institutions and new frameworks, uh, new mechanisms and instruments. Over the uh, last six years, our Antitrust Council has uh, done an enormous uh, amount of analytical work in different industries uh, that resulted in active measures to improve competition. For example, we have done away with the uh, tendering procedure and introducing uh, another procedure, one uh, route one uh, carrier. We are conducting um, a broad investigation of uh, practices of um, mobile services providers together with our Russian colleagues. Uh, pricing is always a focus uh, of our attention. 
at present we are undertaking the investigation of the state of the market of grain. We have established a working group to analyze uh, the market for oil and uh, petroleum products and uh, to uh, draft recommendations uh, to improve the situation on that market. We are also engaged with uh, our counterparts in other countries beyond uh, the Eurasian Union. Latvia, Serbia, Turkey, Austria, Romania. We are promoting cooperation with UNCTAD. We already have a joint plan of action between our regulator and uh, their committee on competition. Uh, very soon uh, in Astana we will uh, step out with a proposal uh, to make Astana a permanently acting, acting platform uh, for competition affairs. The platform would regularly uh, convene uh, experts and analysts and practitioners in this field. I think it's a good idea. Now commenting Igor Yurievich and his uh, case study of pharmaceuticals, I believe uh, this is the right way to, to move forward. The market is huge, the market is growing very fast, it is dynamic, there's a whole problem uh, with the generics and uh, without the help of uh, federal uh, antitrust service and the European antitrust and competition services uh, we will simply cannot solve the problem. Now what we want to avoid is uh, the uh, surge in prices for Western products, uh, pharmaceutical products, uh, sold uh, in uh, our countries. I have recently had a visit to a doctor. He made the prescriptions. I uh, made purchases of uh, on prescriptions and took the medicine with no effect. Then I went to Israel and I bought the same medication which helped me immediately and this is an obvious uh, this has an obvious conclusion that uh, most uh, medications sold in Russia in Moscow is simply fake and given the fact that we are purchasing our medic medical supplies in Moscow in Russia we are, our market is uh, stuffed with fake medication This is a special kind of market, in a way, a market for fake products. We cannot tolerate this situation. Now, we are trying to uh, study uh, the way that things are regulated in other countries. Why it is so easy to fake, uh, fake uh, products uh, in our countries? To take another example, the auto producer Toyota and Nissan has simply prohibited using uh, spare parts from the CIS countries. Now this affects uh, our um, small businesses, small producers of spare parts. They are crying out uh, against discrimination, but what can we do? We are trying to discuss uh, things with our Western partners. Uh, we are often accused that we violate the intellectual property laws. There's so much uh, counterfeit products, uh, fake products, uh, uh, surrogates and so on, which is a violation in their eyes, a violation of intellectual rights. However, things are much more complicated than this plain accusation. There may be cases where this um, reproach is true, like uh, 
spare parts but what about pharmaceuticals I believe the reason why their rights are violated is that they uh, allow their prices for their products uh, to uh, go up which creates a motive uh, for fake producers the same goes for things like um, auto tires we know for a fact that certain branches of bureaucracy like customs are very interested to, to have only one counterpart like a unique importer of uh, car tires like it is the case in Azerbaijan but this creates a motive for uh, for fraud yes for the Ministry of Finance and uh, for custom officials this is a very um, happy situation but not for us not for antitrust uh, authorities I suggest that we again come together with uh, American and European experts and uh, uh, hear their opinion on uh, how things can be regulated. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Golan Basarovich. Now, and questions and answers. Thank you, Galib Zaharovich. You have uh, given us a good idea of your activities uh, in the context of uh, Eurasian integration. However, you have uh, kind of um, limited yourself only to the learning part of your activities. But uh, do you do any? Uh, uh, real regulatory work. Are there any documents already in effect that regulate things, uh, regulate competition? Since I'm in office only um, in my sixth month, I uh, haven't had um, uh, room or space uh, to uh, engage myself in drafting uh, actual recommendations or regulations. Nikolai Bushlakov, you have mentioned the principle of extraterritoriality of uh, your regulations uh, or the model law. Are there any cases of uh, actually applying the case of extraterritoriality? According to my knowledge, uh, very limited knowledge, I don't think we have had any real cases. Uh, of application of uh, this principle we're still an emerging economy we're still working in the mode of um, basically uh, producing and exporting mining and exporting we're still in the stage of formation of uh, major sophisticated industries besides uh, mining no more questions. Now then we will have a little break and I expect you back uh, 12.15 sharp.